Today we celebrate the octave day of the great feast of the Epiphany. Epiphany, it means manifestation. Manifestation of God made man to all of the world. But did you know that that great feast of the Epiphany, January 6th, isn't just the day of one manifestation of Christ upon earth, but rather of three manifestations of Christ upon earth. First, we have the most obvious of these, the manifestation of the Christ child to the Magi, the Gentile world, the three kings that have come from the descendants of Noah, Melchior, the son of Shem, or the descendant of Shem. He is that because Shem is the one from which our Lord would come, and he is the one in which he has that ability, to the, the, the privilege of giving the gift of gold, the kingly gift to the, to the Christ child. Caspar the, the, comes from the line of Jophet, he has the gift of giving the frankincense, honoring our Lord's divinity. And Balthazar, the one who is the darkest of skin, he comes from the line of Ham, who is the one, and he is the one who gives the gift of myrrh, honoring our Lord's humanity and foretelling his death. Some of the spiritual writers state that when these three men, these three great kings and, and learned people, saw the star appearing unto them, it didn't initially appear merely as a point of light, merely as a shining body in the heavens, as a, a star as we commonly think it to be, but rather in its initial appearance appeared in the shape of an infant, an infant who held within his hand a scepter in the shape of a cross. So not only was it a heavenly body that stood out from all of the rest, but it had this very wonderful appearance to it that beckoned them on such a long journey. And as they traveled, they followed that point of light, and as Mary of Agreta says, it wasn't part of the firmament of heaven, but rather was contained in our own atmosphere, if you will, because it needed to point to a very specific spot on the globe, that cave in Bethlehem, and they set out and traveled over a thousand miles across the desert to arrive on the 6th of January. And there they fell down upon their faces, and they adored that child whom they initially had seen in the sky as that great point of light. And they gave him those three gifts, honoring his kingship, his divinity, and his, mor his mortality. God revealed to the Gentiles by the sign from heaven, the coming of the King of Kings, the Messiah, the King of Mankind. However, St. John Chrysostom tells us that there are two other manifestations that <laughs> happen on the 6th of January, the second of which is the, well, the one in which we commemorate today in the Gospel on the Octave Day. That is the baptism of our Lord in the river Jer Jordan. St. John the Baptist, the precursor of Christ, the one who is announcing the way of the Messiah, he reveals the Christ as the God-man. He points him out and says that there is one in the midst of you whose latchet I am on this shoe I am not, not worthy to loose. And then upon seeing Christ in the crowd, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who taketh away the sins of the world. And as if it was not enough to hear it come from the words of St. John, from the mouth of St. John, the one that everybody who was starting to realize to be a great and only man, if that wasn't enough, when Christ was actually baptized in the River Jordan, what do we see? But the Holy Ghost descending upon him as a dove and resting upon him, and the great voice from heaven, heaven proclaiming, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's a second manifestation of Christ, and it happens on the 6th of January. It's a manifestation from heaven itself, 
for all those by the river to see. It's a manifestation that allows people to see that Jesus, the man, he is the promised one. He is the Messiah. It also is a manifestation that recognizes God to be a trinity. And the fact that the Holy Ghost descends upon him and God the Father pronounces him to be his only begotten Son. And third, it is a manifestation that has a calling to it. It calls all of those there to repentance. It calls them to, to that because he has come to redeem them. And it calls them to baptism when the new law were, would take place after our Lord's resurrection. There is a third manifestation, according to St. John Chrysostom, that takes place on the 6th of January as well. This is the wedding at Cana, when our Lord turns water into wine, the first miracle of Christ. This marks our Lord's public ministry beginning. Christ manifests himself to be God at the wedding of Cana, because he works a miracle, and he shows by doing so that he truly is God. He truly is the only one that has power over all the creatures of earth. He controls what is and what isn't. And just by a mere word, water is turned into wine. A substantial change takes place. And those who witness it realize that only God could do such a thing. And this man did that. He reveals himself to be the God-man. The threefold manifestation of Christ on one day of the calendar year. Yes, it took place on three different years. But these signs were there for everybody to witness. A sign from heaven proclaiming him and his coming. God, the Father, revealing him as the Christ, his only beloved Son, and Christ revealing himself as divine through miracles. A threefold manifestation on the Feast of the Epiphany. Now, many more things all throughout our Lord's life would take place where he'd reveal himself repeatedly. He'd work miracles. He'd uh, show himself in his glory on the table or to, uh, the, at the Transfiguration. And many more times he would call people to follow himself, to repent of their sins, and to turn only to him, that they will find the Father only through him. And many indeed would hear him, and many indeed would heed his call and come after him and follow him. But others, they would not. Regardless of how many times and how many instances of miracles and revelations he put forth. Their hearts were hardened and they still wouldn't follow. That was their choice to make. Which calls us to ourselves. All these years later, we're constantly faced with that same choice, aren't we? We constantly have to ask ourselves, would we follow him? Would I follow him after seeing the water made wine and go after him upon his journey and go and sit at his feet and hear him preach and go and sacrifice my time and my efforts just to hear one more word of the gospel preached to me because I had seen the man turn water into wine? Would I be there listening to him? I have to ask myself, if I had heard the voice calling down from heaven and revealing this man to be the only begotten Son of God, the Father, would I then jump into the cold waters of the Jordan? Would I then repent of my sins and turn away from my old life and begin anew in order to strive after serving and loving God each and every day? I have to ask myself, if I saw that star in the heavens, would I pack up 
all my things and set out on a journey in which I knew not the end of, in which I knew not what trials lay ahead of me, and in which I knew not anything except for the fact that it would be long and arduous. Travel over a thousand miles, travel across a great wilderness, a desert, to come to the cave and fall on my face and give gifts of great wealth to a baby. Would I do those things? Would I make those acts of faith at those instances of the manifestation? In those early days of the church, would I be the one who was willing to, to go and follow our Lord as far as could be, knowing very well it probably would mean the laying down of my own life for him? Would I do that and do it willingly? Or perhaps maybe the question's a bit more simple for ourselves. If I knew that God were to manifest himself upon earth, that that was at hand, that I knew the time and the place and the day, would I sacrifice in order to be there to witness it? Well, we do know it. We do have it at hand. He will manifest himself. He'll do so in just a few moments here upon our altar, miraculously, in the flesh, coming to us again. And he does it on a regular basis. How often do I actually think about it in those terms? How often do I think about the, just the majesty that happens at every single Mass, every single opportunity that I have to witness such a great manifestation of Christ? But that's our calling. The bell brings us in. It calls us to pay attention. It calls us to focus upon that singular point at that singular time to witness God made man upon our altar. And I think about all my life and all the opportunities that present themselves. And I have to ask, how much do I follow to that point? How much do I seek that out? How much do I sacrifice in order to be present for it? Do I want to give in order to be able to see and to receive him? Or perhaps it's something that only takes place when it's convenient. Perhaps it's something that I only come to when I'm required to. Perhaps it's something that I only come to so long as it doesn't interfere with my life. It doesn't, as long as it fits in around my schedule of sports or recreation or hunting or projects or whatever type of works around my house that I have to take care of. As long as it doesn't inconvenience me, I'll be there, but... No, that's not the point. All of those who witnessed those early manifestations of our Lord, they sacrificed to follow after Him. They had to give of themselves just for that singular glance, that singular act of adoration. And for us, we have it repeated again and again and again. So ask yourself that question. How much does it mean to you? How much are you willing to give of yourself to witness the greatest miracle upon earth? Come, behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him lifted on high, manifest for you all to see, to adore Him as the wise men did before you, to follow Him as His disciples once did as he walked upon the earth, and to possess him interiorly by a good holy communion, as was done by the Blessed Virgin Mary herself. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.